I needed a discrete logic circuit to prototype something regarding this PS4 Bluetooth to ESP32 controller project because I need a chip and I don't have it in stock, so I'm simulating it with separate logic gates. What I'm working on is a way to replicate a TurboGrafx-16 gamepad controller so that eventually I can make my own circuit version of it and control it over Bluetooth with an ESP32. So this is a proof of concept prototype I'm going to be working with on the breadboard. The TurboGrafx game controller has an 8-pin DIN connector on it, so there's a jack on the console. And in order to connect up my own circuit, I made a DIN 8-pin jack breakout board with today's sponsor, PCBWay. So I can make my own 8-pin cable, plug that in and connect it to a breadboard, or different cables with less pins like this 5-pin DIN can also fit. They just simply don't have the extra pins to make it an 8-pin connector. So I can just use this as a 5-pin DIN breakout as well. I've got two of these jacks here on the breadboard. One, I can plug in the actual TurboGrafx controller, and all the pins are in parallel with another jack, which has a custom cable I assembled. I can plug this into the TurboGrafx-16, have a pass-through to the real controller, look at signals on the scope and see how it works, then unplug the controller and just have wires going to my own circuit to try and replicate gamepad functions. Then I know, once I get it working, in the future I can control it over Bluetooth. Here's a schematic from online showing the parts inside the TurboGrafx gamepad and the pinouts on the 8-pin DIN. The connector provides 5 volts and ground to the gamepad. Then it has four parallel data pins and a clear and select control pin. So out of the 8 buttons on here, which are right here, four at a time are sent over these four data pins using this 2 to 1 multiplexer IC, 74HC157. So whether the select pin on that chip coming from TurboGrafx is high or low, it will route one bank of four buttons to the four data lines, or another bank of four buttons to the data lines. So when TurboGrafx wants to read in a certain bank of four, it'll set the select pin one way, and it knows what data will be arriving on these pins. With the clear, it's connected to an active low enable on this IC. So when clear is low, it's passing through whatever bank of four switches are currently selected. But when the enable goes high, it forces all outputs to be low in that time, regardless of what the switches are doing. So to get a circuit to replicate this, I was trying to use an ESP32 to quickly handle all of this, but it wasn't working because by the time I could read in switches, set data outputs, and be looking at interrupts on these control signals, it would still have a delayed behavior. So the enable goes high and low in a short time. The real hardware will have set these four outputs momentarily low and then high again, and then back to whatever the switches are doing, responding in real time. Meanwhile, the ESP32 is over in the future, finally getting around to responding, because this enable pulse can be within five or even, I think I saw two and a half microseconds of duration. And this chip is responding immediately to that, going high and going low. So I'm going to be ultimately probably using this same 74HC157 when I make a circuit, and I'm just going to hook up an ESP32 to control these buttons over Bluetooth, and then use the real hardware to respond immediately. The controller also has variable speed rapid fire options that you can enable by turning the switch in two different positions, or just off, so it's momentary button action, or hold it down and it will auto fire. That's what this other chip is doing, which is basically a binary counter. It has its clock input connected to enable coming out of TurboGrafx-16. So while TurboGrafx is doing control signals on this chip to read the buttons, we could just tap into one of these pulses as a clock 
to advance this binary counter. And then they're just tapping into a couple of different flip-flop outputs, which is going to be two different slower clock rates compared to the incoming clock. So the turbo buttons here, applying to the two action buttons, allow you to either connect those action buttons directly to ground, so it's a normal button press, or connect it to a certain pulse train at a certain rate, or a different pulse train rate. So you're getting automatic highs and lows as if you're pushing the button. So that's all this second chip is doing. I have the custom DIN 8 cable plugged into the TurboGrafx controller port and it's going to the breadboard. Then there's another DIN 8 jack with the real controller plugged in and all pins are connected. So it's like one long cable to the controller, but I can put scope probes in here. I took the back off the controller so there's the two chips, miscellaneous components. I paused the scope screen right now. Sometimes it's hard to trigger because things are moving all over the place. The bottom trace is the enable to the controller chips. The middle trace is the select, which controls which bank of four buttons are actually being read. And the top trace is just the first data pin, D0, on the controller and that's connected to the up as well as the number one action button on the controller. So depending whether this select is high or low, when the TurboGrafx is actually going to read this data line, this will either correspond to the one button or the up button, and TurboGrafx will know which it is because it's controlling this select. And you can see how periodically it does different things. So if I try to pause, we have all kinds of different conditions happening. The enable comes and goes, select is toggling, and we got these changes on the data pin that we're looking at. So even though I'm not pressing anything, here's a good opportunity to analyze what's happening. So the data pin is going to be pulled high by whichever of the two buttons are routed to that output data pin. So when nothing is pressed, we should see a logic high. But we can see here, sometimes it goes to a logic low. That's when enable is high. And that's because the way the chip works, if enable is high, it doesn't matter what is happening anywhere else. The output is going to be low. And that's what we are seeing here. So it's pulled high, the chip is disabled, and the output is forced low until it's enabled again. And it goes back to whatever the state of the button would be, just pulled high if nothing's being pressed. If I just change the timeline to show more details, we just have this periodic activity and then nothing is happening in between a burst of reading data again on the controller. But when it is reading, it's not consistently seeming to read all buttons over and over to keep the system up to date. It seems like the turbo graphics will change when it's reading the controller based on what's going on. I couldn't really find any information on how this controller mechanism works. While we are enabled, this select is changing between high and low and back to high. So this data line will represent the up button on the pad or the number one action button, depending on how select is set. And the same will be happening on the other three data lines on the controller port. I know the number one or the up is going to do something here. So if I press one, we can see now it's idling low because I'm grounding the button. If I release, it's idling high. Then it's going to read this low state somewhere in there. And now it changed its behavior. It's not reading as many things anymore. So maybe I just accidentally did something in the game and now it's waiting for a different kind of input. So I can still press, and now it went back to reading like that. So that's what I mean by the controller just is being read differently at different points in time. And if I press up, the whole thing is not going low because I guess when select is low, it's only channeling out the number one button, so it's responding low. The up button, when it's time to read, we do see data changing. But in between readings, the select is only looking for button one. For this main switching chip to switch the two banks of four buttons, I've ordered this chip, but for now I don't have it. So I'm simulating it with three other discrete chips. 
I'm using a CD4053 as a 2 to 1 switch IC, and this only has three of these switches in it. So for my test circuit, I'm only going to put three banks instead of four banks of two switches. So those are pulled high. And this is an analog switch, but it's still okay to just put five volts or ground through. So I've got both of these pulled high and then a switch to ground where I can push the switch and try to control TurboGrafx functions. I'm taking the select pin from the TurboGrafx 8-pin cable, and whether it's high or low, it will switch one of these data outputs between one button or the other button for three switches. And then for the other clear pin on the TurboGrafx cable, I'm using it as the enable, similar to the other chip, where if the enable on that chip is low, the data will pass through to one of the data lines on the TurboGrafx cable, but when enable goes high, this data line has to be forced low regardless of what's going on with the buttons. So I came up with this truth table for having an enable and a data and needing to get a certain output to respond that way. And that resulted in an AND gate and an inverter. So I'm using a 74HC08 and a 74HC14. Looking at this truth table, we want it so when enable is high, which is input A, we want Y, the output, to be forced zero. So a high on the inverter gives a low going into one of the AND gate inputs. So as long as this enable is high, this AND gate output is always going to be low. Then when the enable is low, this chip should function normally and pass through whichever button is being selected so basically the enable control on this logic circuit either passes the high or low controller data to the data pin on TurboGrafx or it disables it and forces this low. So I've built that circuit here with those three chips and I have my 8-pin DIN connector ready to plug into TurboGrafx. So this circuit is now plugged in to the controller port on TurboGrafx. So this is an interval where we have the enable temporarily going high. So while enable is high, it forces this data pin low. And then this is the select control pin. And we have five microseconds per division. So because that's such a fast moving pulse, I think it's better to do it in hardware with dedicated chips than doing it in software. On the ESP, if I were generating data outputs, this may be shifted over here after all of these transitions. Then if I have the ESP doing other things, not just dedicated to handling this, there may be even more lag. So I went with hardware. So again, five microseconds per division. Now the enable pulse is even narrower. So I'm using dedicated logic chips and it's able to keep up in real time like the controller does. Now I need to hook this up and see if the buttons are actually responding so that I know I can make my own hardware circuit that behaves like a controller. Now I have the circuit hooked up. I don't remember which button is which and I don't have all controller buttons enabled. I'm looking for the run button. I think that's it. So I'm starting a game. So I can move up. I can shoot two different kinds of fire button. They look almost the same. I can pause. I'll re-enable. I'm probably going to get hit. So now that I have this circuit working, once I get the real chip that I'm waiting for to replace the makeshift logic circuit, I'll retest and make sure it's all good. And then I know I can electrically control the button inputs for a TurboGrafx-16 controller, and I can work on incorporating that into the other ongoing project where I'm turning a PS4 Bluetooth controller into a retro game interface.